welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for November. And uh, joining me, because it's been far too long, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's gone to his uh, city, he's uh, seen his kings, he's then seen his kings and decided to get some games. He's then been out in his garden, he's then went and sorted himself out with a convention which has been successful. He's not going so- south. He's not going north. He's not going east. It's Mr. Frank West. Hello, Frank. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very, very good because I'm really excited to speak to you because it's been far too long and it's always really good to And people speak will have forgotten what we said last time, so we can just do it again, <laughs> we can just right? Do the same <laughs> stuff. We can be like a reboot of the franchise. So I started playing board games when I was <laughs> Fifteen. If you can tell me about that, um, my you've favorite got... games to take onto a treasure island. <laughs> <laughs> treasure island. It's yeah. not a treasure island. It's a deserted island. It is. It's, it's just a no island. island. It's it's a treasure. Treasure. It's treasure. My first, my first thing about my ideal Sunday would be, um, <laughs> it's oh, been, it's been a role. It's been a role. Everybody's going to be saying, "What is actually going on?" And it's like, "Well, Frank's here, so I'm allowed to talk to Frank how I want to talk to Frank." And if you don't like it, I'm really sorry. But you know, uh, Frank's been on for a while now. Uh, the reason that we do this, I suppose, you should tell everyone. The reason that we do this is because, uh, quite simply, I like doing this. So there you go. And if you like doing something, as long as it's legal, then you can continue doing it as long as you enjoy it. Because we've got to like the little things in life. And the second reason that we do this is because me and Frank were talking before, and it's been like a year since me it's and been Frank talked. Um, so the City of Kings came and went and got, was obviously, as we know, it was a blast at the time. And then there was um, fulfillment. Which brought which brought its own kind of rolling the dice kind of challenges in certain ways, um, but then you since launched the City of Games kind of convention down near Bristol, and then you've had Valorian Gardens, which yeah. you've had on Kickstarter, and then you've done a another reprint of City of Kings with a whole pile of other expansions as well. We have. And how's it feeling? Because I I remember it speaking- feels like we've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It's been, you've kind of, it's kind of, I don't know, I kind of like, I think back to like our first conversation when you were kind of like, I have no idea if this thing is going to work. I have no idea where we're going with it. I have some faith in what we're going to be doing. And now you're kind of like, you're not just, you're kind of like, you're designing games, your games are getting funded, but you're doing kind of obviously the the convention stuff as well. So yeah. and we've just done you know the tickets for the second convention went on sale last week so we're now about to do our second <laughs> convention as well which is crazy. Why? I mean I've got uh, I mean the first question I've got to ask is what what made you decide to jump into the convention circle because I'm I'm a, I've been aware of how much work goes into it after kind of dealing with a lot of guys from Tabletop Scotland and the amount of time they were having kind of meetings and discussions behind closed doors and stuff like that. So what made you think, you know, um, I've got three hours free on a Tuesday. What can I do? <laughs> kind of thing. Well, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So for me, it was never like a surprise. It was always in the plan. It was just more of a case of, you know, how and when and kind of how feasible it is. <laughs> so it's something that Bristol is a terrible, terrible place for doing conventions in regards to the finance, but it's the perfect place to do conventions in regards to location. Yeah. And like we just finally got to a point where I felt financially that there was less risk involved in us trying to run the event. Mm-hmm. So as you know, like our company is called the City of Games. Yeah. And that wasn't because that's what I wanted the publishing company to be called. That's because I wanted every year to turn Bristol into the City of Games. Like oh. that was that was always the plan. So uh-huh. um it wasn't just a lucky coincidence, you know. I didn't get two years later. Oh wait, that actually works. Just spin so, it on a wheel or something. What should we call ourselves? <laughs> the <laughs> City <it>. of <laughs> The Meeple Desire. Oh, okay. That's not gonna work. That's going to be something else completely different. Um, but, I mean, you went... I mean, unusually, or unusually when you set the City of Games up, first of all, 
you when you were selling tickets, you decided to go for the crowdfunding um, yes. Kickstarter method. So you were say you're saying, okay, we've got a finite number of tickets. You can buy your passes and stuff like that. Was that? I mean, was there a reason behind that? Was it because you had the success with the City of Kings game that it gave you kind of like a marketing in to these people to say, well, if you like the game, we're also doing this as well. So tell your friends, and maybe you know you can we can actually meet up, kind of thing. There was like an element of marketing to it. I mean, yeah. obviously, Kickstarter is a huge marketing platform, so yeah. that was one part. But I mean, the honest truth <laughs> was that convention was an eight thousand pound gamble for us. You know, yeah. we um, we lost money on that first year. I mean, that was part of the plan, but yeah. it was an eight thousand pound investment, and we kind of went down the path of. Should we just kind of make sure that we're going to sell some tickets before we kind of tick that box and 100% confirm it? And what's really hard is if you launch tickets via a website and you say, hey, ticket sales are now on, like, you know, off, then if you sell 20 tickets, you're kind of in a difficult situation because you don't want to suddenly tell those 20 people, oh, it's cancelled, we're refunding you. But at the same time, you haven't proven that there's an audience for what you're trying to do. So the Kickstarter model really gives you that. It's not about the finance. It's more about Mm. kind of, are there enough people interested in this happening to make it worthwhile? Yeah. And fundamentally, that was what the Kickstarter platform was for us. Okay, okay. And, I mean, did you... because um, was that was the City of Games that came before? Was that before or after the what happened with the actual boxes, the game boxes for the City of Kings itself? Um, it was after. I think the Kickstarter was probably during, give or take. I think the Kickstarter we probably did around November, uh-huh. and we were originally shipping the games for um, trying to get them to people kind of by Christmas. So yeah. it would have been a week either side, I imagine. But I don't, I can't remember exactly. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. during that time, um, you released kind of like a... Um, you released basically, you released a kind of an update to say, guys... Um, the pallets, you know, have been stacked incorrectly, the games, and the games themselves, the boxes have been damaged and we have to get them kind of re, kind of reprinted. And um, I remember reading that and just like saying a couple of, saying a couple of swears and then yeah. just, I think, I, you know, messaged you and went, oh my goodness. Um, I mean, how was that at the time? How did you feel it? I mean, how did you feel at the time? You must have been kind of devastated when it that was. kind of all kicked off. And it was obviously painful and Mm. financially it was very problematic. But for me, you know, I've always had the same desires for quality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was, it was, it was the funniest thing about it because in my head, I never had an intention to not replace those boxes. You know, it was kind of like, whatever it takes, we'll do it and hopefully we can afford to. Yeah. But, it just kind of confused everyone from a, like the fulfillment centers, the shipping companies, they were all like, what do you mean you're going to like redo with the boxes? Normally people just like go, oh, well, that's tough luck and just kind of make do. <laughs> and I was like, now nah, what I'm going to mm. do is I'm going to reprint a few thousand boxes yeah. and then I'm going to ship them to lots of different places and it's going to cost just as much to ship them as the original games because the volume is still, you know, it's yeah, still the same yeah, volume. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm going to ask each of our fulfillment centres to hand repack all of the games and <laughs> ship them out. And they were like can we do that and I was like hopefully you can do it and and that was the thing that surprised me was like obviously for me my perspective was just like how do we fix this how do we get past it because the last thing you want to do is dwell on something you know like when you have a problem there's a lot of people who they'll let that kind of overwhelm them and it becomes too much for them Mm -hmm. was for me I wanted to just focus on what is the solution and We did that, but it just, it kind of blew my mind how unprepared people seem to be to kind of able to implement that solution. I think, I think it is because, as you said, you know, a lot of the time it would be, well, um, send them the games and then what you can do is you can then arrange to ship out the replacement boxes afterwards. I think that's what happens in a lot of these cases. If there is damaged stuff, then kind of, you know, um, 
we're aware of it's damaged, we're aware of some issues, you're going to get your boxes, some of them are going to be potentially a little bit kind of crushed. I mean, was the damage that bad that components inside the boxes were, you know, some of the components were useless, you couldn't be used at all, or, I mean, was the damage, was it more kind of like a cosmetic damage that would have just annoyed somebody if it had been on the shelf? Yeah, I mean, there was, I mean, maybe one or two that yeah. were damaged, where the actual components were damaged. But it was just the boxes, you know, yeah. some of the boxes had effectively holes in them. There was a yeah. lot of kind of um, dents and bangs. And for me, it was always about giving people something they would want to put on the wall, you know, something that they could present as kind of a piece of art in their house. Yeah. And... um it just wasn't that because of the damage. And that was the fundamental reason is that I promised people we would deliver a high quality product yeah. and that damage wasn't high quality in my eyes. Yeah. But the problem was is, and with what you're saying about how people would like ship it out later mm. in my eyes, that wasn't affordable because the shipping cost of the city of Kings is so high. Like it's, it's so much more than you can imagine. Mm. And, mm. um, it's crazy, crazy. And because, again, it's the physical volume, if we had to send a box and then a replacement box, it just literally wouldn't have been affordable. Like, we would have lost yeah. so much money. So it was cheaper to um, bulk ship them to a fulfillment centre and then pay people to repack them than to do two separate shipments. That's That, to me, is just like, I'm just like going, um, really, that's... Sounds doesn't make any sense to me, but I mean logically, I suppose it makes complete sense if that was going to be going to be the case, going kind to of sending it out. Um, at the time, did you feel you were like, "Damn it, we got so close, everything was going yeah. well," you know, manufacturing was going oh. well, the community was loving us, and then you were just like, "Flip sake." Yeah, and the thing was <clears throat> is that even after that issue, hmm. we still delivered like fifty percent of the games within our original shipping timelines, and yeah. The rest of them were within one or two weeks. Like, we didn't delay by more than a couple of weeks. And, you know, there's obviously the odd person who doesn't get it for months because their game disappeared somewhere into some postal system. But, you know, the kind of 99% got them still on time. And that, for me, was the relief at the end. But it was it was such a nightmare because everything had gone so well and we were literally a couple of months ahead because, you know, you put contingency in place to make yeah. sure that when things go wrong, you can fix it. And with our second print run we're going through now, we've had small issue after small issue after small issue and we've eaten up the entirety of the contingency. And, you know, if we didn't have that, we would be shipping late, but because it was in place, we're, we're still on track and we're still doing okay. Yeah. But it was just a shame that with that first print, you know, all of the contingency got et up by one issue on like the last day. Like literally it was the, let's pack them. You know, they're made, they're stacked, let's put them on the boat. And that mm. went wrong. And I was just like, oh my goodness. And it was the most like, it was horrible. But, you know, people reacted to it well. And I feel that the community that I had through that Kickstarter was just amazing. I know there's so much negativity on Kickstarter and people talk about the comments and the hate and the problems, but mm. I never saw that on our Kickstarter. I never saw the kind of the hate when that happened. It was all about, you know, we understand, we care, we're going to help, you know, what can we do? I had people messaging me, offering me money to help fix it, you know, and like there was a person who messaged me and said you know um oh what are they called i think it's chip theory games they do a thing on their kickstarter where yeah. like five people can like pay a large amount of money and they get all of the games for the future years yeah and i had a guy message me and i was like you know i'll give you a thousand pounds and if you want to send me like each of the games you do for the next 10 years or whatever <laughs> then that would be a thing and i'm just That's and people just... were offering that and it was just amazing you know the kind of the way people get together yeah, but that was down to your, your kind of not your honesty, but your straightforwardness with actually telling people what's kind of going on. I mean, I think when the I remember that kind of the the update coming out, and reading it and going, ah, oh, you know, that was awful. But then also you were just like, well, this is a situation. I don't, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. Um, this is going to be a financial kind of issue for us. And I think it was because of your, you were you were you were you know, up front with people and said, right, okay, this could be a potential issue that folk kind of went, well, 
this isn't you kind of maybe potentially keeping stuff from us. This isn't you kind of, well, we had, we had budgeted for, for X, but it's actually going to cost a couple of extra thousand more kind of thing. I think it was a case of, look, this is a, this is a disaster that's happened. And I think people really appreciated you just coming out and saying, well, you know, that was fine. I think it was testament to the community. I mean, I know that, um, you've kept kind of like the Facebook page kind of going and, uh, there's still people kind of posting about, you know, posting gameplay questions and posting kind of like the updates. Has that been, I mean, has that been kind of like a surprising kind of side shoot of the campaign that there now is like a little City of Kings face group book group kind of community that's kind of still very, very active, still asking questions, still kind of helping you to maintain your noise for yourself? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a surprise. Like, it's one of those things where it's certainly, you know, um, like, you can't ever guarantee it's going to happen. You know, you yeah. hope it's going to happen. But I wouldn't say it was a surprise because it was the plan was to always try and have that group and to nurture that group and to hope that we can grow it. And, you yeah. know, I hope that as we move forward that the Convention group and the Rising Blades group and the Vidoran Gardens group can all kind of grow in that same kind of way but it was a surprise like (laughs) and this is totally the wrong word to say but like how easy it was do you know what I mean like the the people just kind of jumped on it there was no advertising it or kind of forcing it at people it was just a it's there if you want to join it that's great and people Mm -hmm. did and Mm -hmm. for me that's been like I think that's been the summary of the last year there's been so many times where we've said to people this is what we're doing. If you want to be involved, join us. And people have. And that, for me, is the surprising bit. You know, like, when we launched the convention tickets um, this last week for um, the City of Games 2019, yeah, it was just the most bizarre thing. Because I put out a post six weeks ago and said, this is the date and time tickets are going on sale. <laughs> and I didn't put anything else out i put no more posts or anything in the next six weeks which isn't the best marketing but you know i just (laughs) i just didn't do anything and then we got to the day before i launched tickets and i said to sarah um do you think that i should probably have like said something you know (laughs) to remind people hello mention it hello no it's fine just let's see what happens is at that point it was too late because if you don't post in a group for a period of time, the yeah. next time you post, people are shown it. It's more visualised to them to try and get people to go back. And it dawned on me that if I made a post the day before, that that post would be the one that's shown to everyone and not the one the next day saying tickets are now on sale. Yeah. So, so we did nothing. And when the tickets went live, I literally I updated the website. I sent out our newsletter, which goes to about 150 people. It's not many. I posted on Facebook and posted on Twitter in our groups. And that's all I did. There was no paid adverts. There was no marketing. There was no sharing it to other places. And we sold 50% of our tickets in nine minutes. And it just (laughs) blew my mind. I was just like, where did all these people come from? How did they remember? How did they get here but what I've kind of learned over the last year is that every time I do something I'm terrified and scared that there's no one out there but our marketing practice is let's not scream and shout at people every day and drive it down their throats it's let's just send out stuff once in a while and people pay attention because when they get it they're interested and you know the reason our newsletter is only 150 people or so for the convention is because i don't force it at people the people who sign up for that are the people who want to know when those tickets go on sale you know and that's it so it's the click throughs and the open rates like the open rates of that email were 96 percent like how many emails do you send <laughs> out that have 96 percent? yeah i don't you know? believe you and i think you're just making that's probably just made up <laughs> But I think you're just yeah, you're just kind of completely making that up. I don't. <laughs> that's not true. I it think, probably is true, isn't it? It's completely true, isn't it? But it is because in two well three years, I guess, like the City of um, Kings newsletter is much bigger, but it's the same deal. Like our open rates and our click through rates are insane compared to the industry averages, and it's because 
whatever I do, I don't just add people to it. You know, I do my mm. best to hide it from people and kind of say, you know, if you really, really want to, it's down there at the bottom of the page and you've got to have to go to the website. You're going to have to scroll through the whole website. It's down there. It's going to ask you lots of stuff. Like it's not going to be quick or easy. Just do it if you want to, you know? And so the people who do it are the people who like in my eyes at least generally want to do it. And therefore um, the percentages and the click throughs are so much higher. I mean, you, but I mean, your mark, I mean, that's your strength of your marketing is going to continue or the strength of the community behind you because um, you did Vador and Gardens, yeah? Yeah. And um, that, I mean, that, that did really, really well. In fact, I think, um, I think Polyhedron Collider, I think one of the things, I think they opened up by saying it's a shame that Vador and Gardens might not get the Kickstarter, Kickstarter spotlight it so rightly deserves. I mean, there was people that were, they were, um, they were heaping praise on it, kind of left, right, and centre. I mean, do you? It kind of took, it kind of took people by surprise in terms of how kind of the gameplay goes straight off the back of City of Kings, which was a kind of a numbers based, kind of you know huge adventure that could swallow up kind of hours of your life. You then released this, what could only be described as. Um, something which you could have had it sitting alongside say maybe King Domino and people yeah. could jump from King Domino and play kind of Vidor and Gardens kind of straight kind of straight afterwards. So um I mean it's it's kind of and it, as I say it kinda it kinda did did really, really well. Was there did you have to change plans after the financial strain that was caused by kind of like the box incident, basically? No, I mean, funnily enough, we had to change plans due to the success of the City of Kings. And that was the thing that kind of changed this last year for me, because the plan was always in like March, April 2018 to launch mm -hmm. Rising Blades, which was the game that obviously I announced like after our first Kickstarter as yeah. our next game. Yeah. And... <clears throat> And that was the kind of plan. And Vidoran Gardens was always difficult in the sense of um, we couldn't do a Kickstarter for it. And I'll, I'll go into the details of that in a minute. But the point was, is it was always going to be kind of, do we go straight to retail or do we kind of add it into something? But then when the City of Kings came out, we just sold out so quickly. Like, as in, like, literally in a couple of days, it was just yeah. gone everywhere. And the demand was so high, and we had to do the reprint for that. And I'd obviously, um, well, I say obviously, I'd been working on, like, small expansions for it anyway for a number of, like, months, well, years, I guess. And it was kind of, um, how do we manage this and so we made a decision to bring the reprint for the city of kings forward mm -hmm. bring those expansions kind of forward so mm -hmm. those expansions weren't meant to be out until next year and by now rising blades was meant to be done but we had to switch them because as much as i wanted rising blades out there financially the most logical thing was to kind of meet the demand for the reprint and we couldn't afford to do a reprint on our own um you know like I'm happy to kind of talk numbers. Our first Kickstarter, I think it made like it was 260,000, something yeah. around there. Yeah. And our manufacturing bill for our second print run, just the manufacturing bill, so not shipping, not anything else, was $255,000. So if you convert that over, you're talking probably around 200,000. So our second print run cost us nearly as much as we raised in our entire first like Kickstarter. And that's, that's why incredible. we had to go back to Kickstarter. And yeah. the shipping bill, you know, is another 100,000 plus. So if you had shipping and manufacturing, those two numbers are higher than the number we raised in that first <laughs> Kickstarter. So we couldn't do what we wanted to do with the reprint and kind of do it ourselves, which is why we had to do that second Kickstarter. And at mm. that point, you know, I wasn't comfortable chucking rising blades at people whilst we kind of were still doing you know the effectively the extension to the first kickstarter i mean that's kind of how i see it in my head you know it's it's a reprint but really it's just like part two for those who missed the first one yeah and for those who want the extra add-ons yeah so 
And Rising Blades, because of that, it took a bit of a hit in terms of the time I could dedicate to it. So, you know, the first few months of this year weren't spent on it how they were going to be. So that all kind of got shifted back. And what it's meant is Rising Blades, now when it releases next year, will have had so much more time on it. And I'm much happier with where it's at anyway. So it's kind of been a good thing. But with Vidoran Gardens we had to find a home for it. And I wanted Vidoran Gardens to be cheap. Like I wanted the price point for it to be what I wanted it to be. And that was, you know, £17 kind of RRP. And I wanted you to go to a shop and pick it up. Yeah. And when I went and did the shipping cost for it, so not manufacturing, not the importing, but just direct shipping, the average prices were between 7 and £11, pounds, depending on where you were in the world. And it was like, well... I can't do a £17 game and then charge people £11 for shipping. No, no, yeah. And if I say, well, it's £17 and you pay a fiver for shipping and I pay a fiver, then all I'm effectively doing is I'm making you pay a fiver more than you'd pay in a store. And it just, it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted it to be, you could get it for what it was. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we basically said you could have it as an add-on for the City of Kings print. And people could buy just Vidoran Gardens and every single person who bought just Vidoran Gardens on our Kickstarter I've lost like eight or nine pounds for, you know, that was why we didn't kind of do a mash push because we wanted people to be able to get it shipped with their other stuff. And we didn't want to say, no, you can't just buy this, but we didn't want to push it too much because we lost money on that. And the goal in the long run was to kind of go into retail with it and to have it at conventions and to kind of have it as you say, kind of a King Domino, which just sits in a store and people yeah, can pick yeah, up. Yeah. And, the people who bought it during the Kickstarter, I see them as basically having, you know, early access. It's kind of like a pre-release kind of first copies whilst the rest of them kind of ship out. And, you know, I'm really pleased to say that Vidoran Gardens has gone massively into distribution. So next year, um, when it releases, um, it's going to be in 17 countries and it's going to be in retail in those countries, which is fantastic. So pretty much, you know, anyone listening, I expect can go to their local board game shop, ask them if they're getting it in and they could get it from their distributor, which, you know, ticks the box so perfectly for that game. How easy was it to get into distribution? Because... <clears throat> I've seen some people talk about distribution as that's where you want to be heading for, that's where you want to be aiming for, and if you can get into distribution, it can be, you know, it can be a good thing. It can, it can, it can really help with the the kind of business, especially if you're not sure about the uncertainty of kind of how Kickstarter works. You know, um, so I don't feel I feel that like I live in a magic box and everything I do shouldn't work and it does work and <laughs> right okay I can't give any advice to anyone else because if you watch how I do things it's just like I've got my little wand and I know there's no such thing as wizards but like I'm pretty close you <laughs> it's know it's just I mean? not go close <laughs> like, let I'm me close guess let me guess right let me guess right you were at Marks and Spencer's grabbing some grabbing some lunch with Sarah and you were in the queue and there was somebody in front of you and you were just having a general conversation about you know thank goodness the box thing was sorted out with City of Kings <laughs> and that you couldn't wait to get the door and gardens out there and then the person that was in front of the queue was like an executive for like um, is Devium or Asmodee or something and they went oh are you Frank West from the City of Kings and then it kind of took it from there was it as easy as that Frank? Like, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> want to say it was so difficult. Do you know what I, mean? I mean, it. I mean, literally. I mean, I'll I'll tell you the story because I'm totally fine with it. But to say, <clears throat> my attitude to a lot of things is, I don't. I you know, I'm happy to sell. You know, a lot of people say that I'm very good at marketing and sales, and in my eyes, I just feel like I just enjoy chatting and talking openly and honestly, and those two things kind of cross over. But what I don't like to do is I don't like to chase and I don't like to, I, it's not really like act desperate, but you know what I mean? I don't want to be that guy who's constantly pushing you, pushing you, pushing you and going after you and trying to get you to kind of give me your attention. What I like to do is prove myself. And when I prove myself, one day you're going to turn around and go, I should probably check that out because that seems like something I should pay attention to. So basically, I went to UK Games Expo this year and um, 
a guy from Asmodee UK came over and who bought some copies of the City of Kings from the first print run. And he was like, how's things going? And I was like, it's great. You know, things are going really well. Um, you know, at some point in the next year or two, I might start looking at kind of wider distribution, but at the moment it's fine. And that's all I said. And he turned around and said, well, it sold really well for us. Like, I know loads of other distributors from all over the world. Um, I'll If I see them, I'll let you know. And I kid you not, like, a couple of hours later, I had a queue of distributors at my booth from all over <laughs> fighting for our games. And it was just the most bizarre thing. So by the end of that day, I had sold, um, what, to 17 countries. And, like, we had the contracts all written up within a week. So they all just came to us off the back of, like, that conversation. And that was it. And I'm, like, it was done and dusted. And that was kind of, you know, incredible for us. Like, it's the most amazing thing. But there was no work <laughs> involved in it at all. So what Frank's saying is if you want to get into distribution, stand about. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> stand about. Just... Stand about an expo and then wait for them to come to you. Because that seems to be the case of what happened. Do you know what I mean? You should write that in a blog. Like, we're <laughs> the just, only people that can go to a convention. <laughs> we went there with no stock because we <laughs> sold out before the show, which is just the like the story of my life. I've been going to conventions for three years and I've never had a game to sell. And it's like, to really upset me. But we went to that show and we had nothing to sell. So we were just there doing demos, you know, obviously doing pre-orders for people who want them. Yeah. And we sold like 20,000 games on that show because of distributors. And it was just like, well... Probably was worth going, you know. We, we had a lot of fun and we sold a few things. So, um, but no, I mean, in all seriousness, like it is luck and it's not luck, but it's about kind of biding your time for the right moment. Because what I've learned from business, and this isn't from board games, it's just business in general, is you stand you, about and you wait long well, enough, yeah. then if, people if will just go turn to about. people. <laughs> You know, exactly. And you hope someone brings you a cup of tea whilst you wait. Oh, that's but, so, so lovely. But this is the thing, right? If you go to people and you send them emails, you are the person who contacted them. They are the people who kind of, they are the deciders at that point because they're the people who choose if they want to talk to you. And they kind of run that conversation. And they are the people who can just never respond or they might respond, but you do it at their pace and so on. Whilst if you just kind of, like sit around and wait but you know ticking the right boxes doing the right things <laughs> then eventually oh god it sounds awful doesn't it, does, it? it sounds you so know. bad son but... if you sit around and do nothing <laughs> at all you know they'll oh. they'll come to you <laughs> oh is that right oh, dad <laughs> one day all this will be yours what the curtains <laughs> you know <laughs> I just oh, see that would be know. a better version of the Lord of the Rings, wouldn't it? That would <laughs> just be like, much Frodo, better what version of it. I just think I'm that, sit I don't know. And wait. <laughs> it's like I don't know. I can't. You can't say now. Listen to listen to Frank West talk about how he got into distribution. <laughs> you know how he got into it's. You know, oh, how did you do a convention? Well, I just decided to go and do something in Bristol, <laughs> my lover, and then we set it up, and the next thing you know, put it on Kickstarter, and all the tickets sold. So you know, the, and then we didn't do any advertising for the second convention. We sold all the tickets. Half the tickets in the first day without telling anyone, oh, and it's like please. that's amazing. <laughs> Literally, I mean, the takeaway from this like podcast is just don't build up your newsletter, um, don't pay for adverts, <laughs> and just sit around and wait, basically. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it works out for you. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't recommend it as like that's just the fantastic. top business plan, but. <laughs> You know, if if you're going to the yes. bank for a loan and they say, "What's your six month plan?" Don't say, "I'm going to sit around and wait," because you're not going to get it. And if you, you know, on your Kickstarter, like you know, this, what am I going to do once I've got your money for the next six months? You know, yeah. sitting around and waiting is not something to write on there. But it. Oh my word! That's but so funny. The point funny. is, is that it is an industry where there are so many people trying so desperately to get somewhere and that's the same in all industries you know people wanting to start this up and everyone tries so hard and people do what they can and you know it's you know i spent years before our first kickstarter trying to get somewhere and it's really really difficult but sometimes people they like they over try in some areas and what you need to do in my eyes is you need to remain kind of 
at a point where you still have some control, where you still have some kind of dignity and you're not desperately just trying to get every sign up and everyone to take notice, but you're strategically targeting the right people at the right time. And that's what it's kind of about. You know, our first Kickstarter, we had those two videos, Man vs. Meeple and Rado, and they yeah. were the only two videos we did. And I spent 12 months getting to a situation where I could guarantee that we would have those two videos for that Kickstarter. I didn't send out hundreds of review copies to hundreds of different people. I sat down and said to myself, who are the right you know, board game reviewers, run-throughers, whatever you want to call them, for my game in this industry at this time and how do I form the relationship with them to get that to work and that's what we do you know we don't just blaze like just like smear campaign everything out there you know I was talking to our um one of our distributors and he said that they get 250 emails a week from people asking them to distribute their new games like, it's in new people, 250 a week contacting them. And they said, you know, so many of them, they don't get past the email because it's just, there's just too much. And you'd have to have multiple people full time. So if you want to get into distribution, you can be email 251 of this week. Or you can find a way to get yourself in front of those people for two minutes. And at that point you prove yourself so like Mm -hmm. in all seriousness do you know how we got into distribution with the guys from america like the biggest ones for us they came up to the booth and they had a quick look we talked for a few minutes and they said you know can you send us a copy so we can have a play and see how it works and i looked at them and i said how long have you got until your next thing and they said 10 minutes and i said great i promise you that in four minutes I can teach you the entire game, all of the rules, everything you need to do, and you would have taken your first turn and you'll understand it. And they both looked at me and they basically said, you're on, you know, they're like, this they game on. is huge. How are you going to yeah. do that? So we sat at a table and they started um, a stopwatch and I yeah. did it in two and a half minutes. And in two and a half minutes they had a turn and they knew how to play the game. And that's because I took that moment, you know, I kind of, I, I gambled it on my confidence in how to kind of teach and kind of show my product to people. And that impressed them enough to kind of tick that box. So it's taken years, obviously, to get into that situation, but I took advantage of it. And that one moment is so much better than an email that I might have sent to them six months ago, because Mm -hmm. it's a memory for them. You know, they're probably always going to remember that moment. And it's now a mutual thing. They came to me, we talked, and it organically grew, rather yeah, than, yeah. you know, it's like people say when you kind of, you know, use dating apps and dating websites, that horrible awkwardness of, you know, we've been chatting <laughs> online and now we're meeting for the first time. Like, you don't want that. If, you, if you've got a relationship, you want to meet them in a pub, you want to meet them in the club, and, you know, the dating <laughs> websites are fantastic, I'm not knocking them, yeah. but I'm pretty sure that anyone, if they could just organically meet someone at a shop you know or whatever that would be their preference and that's what you kind of we've kind of do it's about maneuvering ourselves into those situations so that we sit around and wait until the right guy's there basically are you, are you just saying you stood outside somewhere and you waited until sarah bumped into you is that what you pretty, pretty much, much pretty for much. six months stood out there every day in the rain <laughs> oh, who <are> you? <laughs> oh you look nice kind of thing um I I don't know. I think one of the things that is, um, I think one of the reasons that you're, that you've got where you are is, um, you've always, you've always got a bit of energy about you, but you're not kind of overly kind of excitable. You kind of come across as kind of fairly genuine when you do that. Um, I mean, are you, are you feeling the kind of the pressure of kind of being, part of the overall brand of the city of games as well yeah, i mean there's pros and cons to it and i want to kind of pre-start this with before i did the board game stuff you know my life wasn't that different in some respects so mm. these days and that's because you know i was self-employed i ran my own business and it wasn't board game stuff but whenever you do that it's always going to be hard work and it's always going to be stressful and i would say now 
I love my life. You know, I love the fact that I went to America a couple of months ago. I love the fact that I've just been in Germany for a week. I love the fact that in two weeks' time, I'm going back to America. I love the fact that I've now produced two games and four expansions. And by the end of next year, that will be four games and at least four expansions, you know. And I love that side of it. But, and, you know, we would have run the two conventions by the end of next year as well. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, every day has stresses and difficulties and you know i mean i would say comfortably that i spend two or three nights sleeping on the sofa rather than in bed with sarah because i have too much on my mind and i'm one of these people who i don't switch off and like i'll just stay up all night or i'll be um you know thinking about stuff whilst just kind of watching stuff or kind of trying to relax but i just don't fall to sleep on those nights and my my life has always kind of been like that like when i was younger i only slept five nights a week and i only slept four hours a night so i used Mm. to live off 20 hours sleep for many many years so but these days you know I find that there's constantly stuff going on. Like right now I'm managing the shipment of the City of Kings reprint and there's been a lot of complexities in that. I'm managing the shipment of Vidoran Gardens. I'm managing the shipment of the expansions. Um, At the same time, I'm organizing the convention. At the same time, we've just done Essen and in two weeks we're going to America for two weeks for PAX Unplugged. I'm also trying to manage um, Rising Blades and Project Ella, which is another game that we're doing. And Mm. both of those need to be done to a certain level before we get to pack so all of this stuff in my head is just constant logistics design testings how's the artist doing how's the sculptor doing you know what's happening here what's this person doing and we're also in the process of moving house you know so because it seemed like a great time to do that (laughs) perfect time and i'm looking at my cupboard going we've got 750 board games now and we have to move those you're like, how do you do that? You know, because like, <laughs> you can carry, what, four or five boxes at a time? So that's hundreds of trips, like hundreds of boxes. And I've done that. It was a trip, oh. like, take I had about, was it? I think it was like, my, my wife was saying, you've got far too many games, you must have hundreds there. And it turned out it was like, I just got about maybe 57? Yeah. Which take up a lot more room than you kind of think, and it must have been at least about four five or six cardboard boxes because you don't want to pack everything together. So I can't even begin to imagine no, how I mean, many. I can't wait to do the phone call with the <laughs> movement men because I've done this before where they're like, oh, so where are you moving from currently? Oh, a two-bedroom flat. Okay, we'll send a medium-sized van. No, um, no sorry. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> let me just kind of clear a few things up for you. We've yeah. got 15 cubic metres of board games. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, what do you mean, like, cubic uh, meters? Like, yeah, literally, you know, if you stack them up, you could feel like a medium sized bedroom quite comfortably with them. That's oh, amazing. So you're probably going to need a slightly bigger truck. Oh, we're probably going to need a lorry. Oh, no, we'll get them in. Well, let me just go further. We've also got a five person mm. office that's currently all the furniture is stored in our garage. Oh, so you've also got an office in your two-bedroom flat. <laughs> yeah, we do. But let's not stop there. We've also got um, eight large storage units that we use for our convention that we run every time. <laughs> and we've got 30 square meters of expo space exhibit display things. I just, you know. And it's just, you know, just little things like that where I kind of think, I wonder we're moving house. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean... This is the plan, though, isn't it? I mean, the convention is going to keep going. You've got Rising Blades coming out. You've got the next project and a project coming out. Um, I mean, you you must be incredibly proud of yourself of everything that you've achieved. I mean, is it hard to kind of just stop for two minutes and kind of gaze at everything that you've done and you know, kind of be kind of give yourself a little bit of a congratulatory kind of pat on the back for what you've achieved because look at it this way there's a lot of people um <clears throat> there's a lot of people who have started on the same journey in similar circumstances and haven't got as far as you've got you know or are you just kidding well it's just one of these things i just stand around and wait everywhere and it just happens so it's not like i'm doing anything kind of thing. <laughs> oh god 
<laughs> I shouldn't be laughing right now because I know how serious this question is, but I'm just looking at my recording track, realizing that this probably doesn't look quite right. So hopefully <laughs> we're recording the sound for this. It's fine, right? Because this is what the viewers want. I say viewers, the listeners want, right? They, <laughs> the viewers they want, want someone to be 40 <laughs> minutes into a podcast a... Yeah. and then start talking about whether they're actually recording. Because <laughs> now we're in that situation where if it is recording, I just look like a pillock, right? And if it's not recording, then... <laughs> it's all right. I'll, um, I'll make sure it's definitely edited out if you do, if there's any chance... You could sound like a pillock at all, Frank. You know me. I'm not, I'm not the type of person to kind of, uh, you know, capitalise on other people's misfortunes in any way, shape, or form. You're never going to be able to edit this. Good luck. So, going back to your question. <laughs> we, we, we might as well keep going, right? We're 40 minutes yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I'm like, just going to cry and shake in the corner if this is thing, because you know what I mean? I've got other people to speak to after you, so it's this fine, is it. This is our window of opportunity, Mr. West. But answer the question, on you go, sir. Like, I do. I do get to look back at it, and I do enjoy it. And I I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't happy and I wasn't excited. And, like, you know, I don't, for, the, for a single minute, want anyone to feel bad or whatever about anything I've said, because... I love it, and I do this to myself. I could work less. I could work, you know, I don't have to do a convention. I don't have to release two games a year. I don't have to be doing this, you know. I don't have to go to America, like, for all these shows. I'm doing it because I love it, and I'm doing it because I'm so, so happy that I get to do this, you know. And you say about kind of, like, kind of my, the way people kind of perceive me and that happiness and how it feels genuine and stuff, and it truly is. It's because I spent so many years of my life doing stuff I didn't want to do and now I enjoy myself I do what I want to do and there's no one to tell me that I'm kind of you know wasting time or whatever like today is a great example I got up this morning I went to the pub at 11 a.m they were doing pancakes for 25p each I got two of my friends to come to that pub and we sat there for eight hours and played games we picked up from Essen whilst eating 25p pancakes that were being brought to us regularly and then I came home and I'm chatting to you and I mean, as somebody who has been in the industry and as, you know, you are the kind of the little Frankie West that could, have you got any advice that you would pass on to somebody who's who's sitting there with a white piece of paper paper in front of them? They've got some dice, they've got some counters, they've got themselves a title, they've got some basic uh, mechanics. Um, Would you have any advice for them at all? As to, to what Probably they should recommend that they get a pencil or something to write on the paper with. I mean, that would be a good start. <laughs> <She could jump. laughs> but, but honestly, just sit around and wait. <laughs> like, it's work for me. <laughs> but no, I mean, in all seriousness, like, it's different for everyone. And I think this is one of the things that it, it doesn't bother me about the industry, but I find kind of interesting is people love to learn from each other and people love to kind of follow the rules. And I think that that's such a good thing to do you can lead through people um, learn through people's experiences and stuff but you also you need to find out what's unique about you you need to learn kind of what it is you're doing that makes you different and you need to nurture that and you need to kind of grow from it and for me like the most important thing is just to make sure every day you're doing something, you know, to make sure that you're progressing and not being afraid, not being afraid to share ideas, not being afraid to do play tests. So Rising Blades, like, it's the most bizarre thing because Rising Blades is a big box game. You know, it's not as big as the City of Kings, but it's a full kind of, you know, ticket to ride square box that's full of stuff. It's a big two hour kind of game. And the first time I play tested that with people who wasn't me or weren't me was um, less than two hours after I started designing that game. And <laughs> like the City of Kings, it took me like a year before I did that first play test. But with Rising Blaze, I was just like, 
I've got this neat idea, you know, I need a few tiles with this, a few bits with that, wrote it all up, got a couple of people and said, can we just sit down and play this and see what it's like? And they're like, sure, that's fine. And it worked and I iterated it and iterated it. And over the next year, it slowly developed into being the game. And now, you know, a few years later, it's like this big proper game, which I think is amazing. And it's that where you just have to have the confidence that people aren't going to tell you, you know, horrible things. You just need to get on with it. I, um, on Tuesdays, you know, joking aside with the pub today and stuff, our Tuesday kind of gaming day is my opportunity to do a lot of playtesting. And often these days, I'll get on the bus to go there and I'll create something new on the bus. Like I have a deck of card, blank cards in my bag at all times and I'll have an idea and I'll just create something and we'll get there and they'll be like, oh, what are we going to play? You've got these games from Essen, you've got this and that. And I'll be like, hey, we're playing the game I made 10 minutes ago. And <laughs> we'll sit there and play it. And for me, it's about that. And that's not because I think suddenly this is going to be my next game, but it's just about seeing how things work. It's about yeah. testing. And it's the most important thing is do something. Because if you don't, you'll never start. Like, creating a game is super, super easy. Creating a fun game that people enjoy and is worth making is a little bit harder. Yeah. And you can never understand what your idea is hmm. until you've played it. <laughs> that sounds like sound advice. And remember and wait around a bit. And remember and try and be infectious, uh, infectious in terms of your energy as Frank has, because... <clears throat> Um, it's those 25p pancakes that get you <laughs> all over the place. They were bright blue. You're still kind of coming down off the kind of the <laughs> colour rush. I don't know what E numbers they had, but they had all of the E numbers and they were fantastic E numbers. Um, you've got a lot going on. It sounds like um, the last, you know, obviously the last couple of years have been a blast so far. It sounds like the next couple of years are going to be even kind of more of a blast. Um, for people who want to keep an eye on where you are, what you're up to, what you're doing. Where can we find you, Mr. Frank West? Ooh, everywhere. I mean, it's super exciting. But the thing is, as I said earlier, is I don't like to tell people because otherwise <laughs> they sign up and they don't really want to. But you no, know, that's you... not what we're talking. There we go. That's not what <laughs> that's we're talking. If, if you want to find us, then yes. search for us, you know? <laughs> what I want you to do is I want you to look at the name of the episode, go into the description, find the name of our company, then Google yeah. it, and then okay. try and find That's us. That's your there. first task. What I'm going to do is I'll put the link into here, let me Google that for you. And what you'll find is actually um, sign-ups for all of these things. We only have active between 4 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Tuesdays. So, And I won't tell you what time saying. But <laughs> you oh can just sit word. around and wait. But no, in all seriousness, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as City of Games HQ. You mm. can find our website as thecityofkings.com or thecityofgames.com if you're interested in the convention side of things. And you can find me on Board Game Geek and anywhere else that potentially has social interaction online. <laughs> exactly. And as usual, we'll make sure that we put all these links in the show notes so that we have notes to show. Um, Don't make if it you... too easy for them. Put little no. clues so they can work out where I might, they are in them. I might actually put your show notes in the next episode show notes just to... <laughs> Like a little treasure, like Scroll a little back treasure to September trail. September two thousand and seventeen. Exactly, exactly. Just you know, just like muck around with folks' heads. It'll be like uh, time good. time stories or something like that. Um, if you want to find out what we're up to and uh, the well, yeah, and we're continually surprised what people do, and and always delighted when people kind of reach out and speak to us. You can find us on Twitter at We Are Not Wizards. We're on Facebook at We Are Not Wizards. We are on. Instagram at We're Not Wizards. We're on YouTube, which is We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast. You can find us on our website, which is We're Not Wizards.com, our blog, which is We're Not Wizards.blogspot.com. If you want to help us keep the wheels from the door, you can chuck us a buck every month on Patreon because on occasion I mention it and it's always nice to have. We have, um, yeah, it's, um, we have a lovely, Number of wonderful backers who it's help quite us. Nice place. I came across it the other day. I, yeah. you know, I completely forgot it existed, but there it was, and <laughs> it's go. a good thing. And people yeah, should definitely go to your Patreon. It's a it's a it's a decent thing to do. Um, but if you um, if you want to find us on the different podcast catchers, we're on Stitcher and Speaker and all the other places. We are, of course, on Apple Podcasts as well. 
And as we say, if you do like us very much, please drop us a subscription because that helps us get into the good books because Santa's just round the corner. And if you want to get that extra special present, then just go and rate us or give us a review. If you are going to rate us or give us a review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big headed. But don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Give us five stars because it's in the middle when it's average. And we are decidedly average. But the person who's not been average is the rather wonderful, the rather fantastic, the rather amazing, the rather accomplished, successful Mr. Frank West. Thank you very, very much, sir, for coming on. There, um, there is only three more things to do. Three the first, more? My goodness. Three. <laughs> I've three still got so many stories. Do. We could go for another hour. If no, you no, 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 no. The three more things to do. The first thing is to remember that is if you're interested in winning yourself a copy of the game Sword Crafters from Adam's Apple Games, all you need to do is to send us a picture of a sword that you've crafted. It can be out of anything at all. We're going to be closing the competition in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to pick a winner. And that person, whether you be in the state side or whether you be on the UK side, is going to get themselves a shiny new copy of Sword Crafters, the game, which you've had a shot of, and it's an awful lot of fun. The uh, So, yes, do that, and uh, you might be in the chance of winning a game. The second thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Frank? We are certainly not wizards. Oh, you absolute darling. <laughs> stunning, stunning man. Next Andy, <laughs> Don't. And the third thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Frank. Say goodbye, Frank. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from you. <laughs> say goodbye, you. <laughs> goodbye, you. Remember, stay safe. Roll6s.com. And um, <clears throat> don't go north, don't go south, don't go east, go west. <laughs> And just sit around and wait until the next episode. <laughs> exactly. Life is peaceful there. Go west in the open there. Go west. You've got games it's to like play. like that rice pudding. Go advert. west. <laughs> He's got plenty to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah, we'll have links in the show notes. Go find Frank. Watch him on YouTube. He's incredibly infectiously kind of energetic and really obviously has a passion for what he does. And uh, certainly, you know, Rising Blades. Yeah, it'll be out. Check it. It'll be fantastic. But until the next time, goodbye. A wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. <laughs> <laughs>